My dear friends, my dear Ukrainian and Swedish friends, welcome to Ukraine Vision 2023. My name is Yulia Matosenko and I'm a project manager for Ukraine Vision 2023 and I also represent Nordic Ukraine Forum, which is an organization that has a mission to build bridges between Sweden and Ukraine. Before the war, it was the expert uh, knowledge that we were like providing this as our main activity. Uh, but since February 2022, we have been running many other initiatives, including support for Ukrainian refugees, organizing weekly demonstrations in support to Ukraine, uh, and many other. Uh, as we all know, the ongoing Russian war against Ukraine is motivated by a denial of Ukrainian identity, culture and the right for self-determination for the Ukrainian people. Uh, by inviting artists and cultural workers from both Ukraine and Sweden, we want to highlight the role of culture both on and off the better fields, as well as to give room for conversations about how literature, music, theatre and humour affect society in times of crisis. Thus, we from Nordic Ukraine Forum are very glad to uh, invite you to this event with the theme Cultural Dialects. Through Ukraine Vision 2023, we want to create a better understanding of Ukrainian culture, its condition during the war, the creative resistance, and discuss what lessons Sweden uh, and the world can learn from what is going in Ukraine. Ukraine Vision is organized together with uh, United Voice, um, with sponsorship from Nordic Light Hotel, Canadian Embassy in Sweden, and also with support from the Cultural House of Stockholm, as well as with the financial support from the city of Stockholm. A United Voice is a label and management agency representing international artists in Sweden and their mission is not only to be a contact between artists and bookies, but also to be a link between different countries and cultures. Nordic Light Hotel uh, is a contemporary design hotel in the very heart of Stockholm. I want also to present two fundraising initiatives that we all ask you to uh, donate during those days, <coughs> if possible. The one is Books for Future, which is fundraising uh, Nordic Ukraine Forums, fundraising initiative um, uh, with the purpose to buy, bring and spread Ukrainian books for children in Sweden from Ukrainian publishing houses, especially those who are in need. Uh, the second initiative that we um, in encourage you to donate funds is Ukrainian Volunteer Hub Stockholm, which focuses on providing humanitarian aid to the citizens affected by the war in Ukraine. They also support the Ukrainian defenders who bravely resist invasion. So welcome to Ukraine Vision 2023, and we hope that during those four days you will get more new insights about Ukrainian culture, Ukraine's past to nowadays and future. So now I'm happy then to invite uh, the panel discussion why is Ukraine important for the world, which will be moderated by Lisa Birval, uh, who is a journalist and writer. Recently she uh, she released the book Slava Ukraini, which I believe she can tell you more words by herself. So you, the floor is yours now, Lisa. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone who's come here today or have stayed in the room, because we have already had a really fascinating panel discussion, which some of you then missed at one o'clock about how to narrate uh, the horrible things that are happening in Ukraine. How can literature handle uh, the war? But now we are going to speak about what's going on in Ukraine from a much wider perspective, actually. We have representatives here from, from science, from economics, from security policies, um, and we will try to tie this together under the headline of why Ukraine matters so much to the world. 
And uh, let's just introduce you from left to right, I think. Tobian Becker, you are the director of the uh, Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics. Is that right? Absolutely. And we can call it SIT because it's a bit easier. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Very warm welcome to you. And Katarina Trax, you are the director of the Stockholm Free World Forum. Should we say this is the leading forum on security policy in Sweden? I think so, yes. Yes? <laughs> okay. And we have Vartan Kevulatsa. You have just arrived from Ukraine uh, at the Taras Shevchenko University in Kiev. You're a philosopher, translator, writer, and probably many other things too, right? But these are the main yeah. titles. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. A warm welcome to you. Uh, I was worried I didn't get hold of you via email, so we're extra glad that you made it here um, to Stockholm in time for this. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Julia Yurchuk. Is that the correct pronunciation? Perfect. Yes. <laughs> uh, you are Ukrainian, but you work and live in Sweden since a couple of years back, right? Uh, 14 years. 14 years. Um, so you could actually understand us very well in Swedish, right? I think so. But we will have this in English anyway. Uh, you are a historian at Södertörn University, and you specialize in memory, religion, with a particular focus on Eastern and Central Europe. Yep. Yeah, and Ukraine, of course, yep. including. Welcome to you. Thank you. So, since this is such a huge topic, what we decided was to start with the present and then move into discussing the future. Obviously, almost exactly one year has passed since this full-scale invasion. I want you to tell us a bit about how this has changed Ukraine and its people, starting with you coming straight from that country, and Europe as a whole, given your respective economic security policy and so on. Um, but starting with you, of course, how has this changed Ukraine and its people? You mean this, this year, this year? Of, yes, of this the, year that has passed. The invasion. <coughs> oh, uh, it would say it's hard to tell about that because we are inside this, the, the story. Yeah? And uh, I repeated uh, that uh, we need uh, some distance. Yeah, philosophers, humanitarians, we need some distance to, to explain, to interpret, to understand what, what and that. Yeah? That's why uh, we are all Ukrainian people and probably all people who support us all over the world, we are in the middle of the story. Uh, that's why it's very complicated for me as philosopher yeah. to, under, to, to describe, to, to understand and to explain what, what does it mean for us. And uh, for example, I, I, I started the book before the war about the philosophical anthropology and I stopped this process because I understand that I can't write this book now. I should write the very short essays about the situation in Ukraine, all, uh, in, in Ukrainian and German language here. Yeah. So probably the, um, I would say the, the style of life, our life is, is, is changed, yeah? it's, uh, it's, a, it's a war. Yeah? And, and, and uh, I would say it, it's 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 very it's very uh, it's it's experience of pain I would say for me, uh, but at the same time it's very important experience for me. So I would say like a person, uh, I don't know if I need this experience, but it, it comes yeah? and it changed me. It changed the style of my thinking. It changed the the whole attitude to, to do my life in Ukraine uh, but I, I was waiting for that yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't a surprise for me that's why, uh, that's why I can describe the, the experience of the citizen, other citizen of Ukraine uh, who didn't wait this who had an illusion that this, uh, this war uh, will we'll come to our houses. Uh, as a philosopher, I say it, it, it's very it, it's very hard to me to to explain the situation because we are in the middle of the story. But uh, once more, my my own my personal experience, uh, for example, about my book, 
before this invasion, I didn't uh, think that I should should write about the philosophy of war. Yeah? When I when I when I uh, when I'm writing about the philosophical anthropology, about the philosophical theory of of human being, um, it, it was not my idea to to write about the war. But now I'm sure that it absolutely important to write not about the war only like a, an event, a yeah, like historical event, but we should we should discuss, describe and uh, explain the, the, the deep grounds of the war. Yeah? And that's why it, it's a new topic for me yeah? and I, I should write about that. So the, the war changed us and everybody of us, not only the the people who go to to front, front line, but all people who live in Ukraine, and uh, we will see. As I said, we are in the middle of the story. But the main, but the main thing that I would want to say, uh, as for me, it's a very dangerous illusion for all of us. That uh, so we we are dreaming about our victory, yeah? and, but as for me, our victory is not a point of the future, like a day of the victory. So we, we use, for example, we use very often in our in our articles and even in social media this uh, slogan "Ukraine will win." Yeah? But I say uh, uh, that we we should we should change the mode of this slogan. We should use not future indefinite. We should use future continuous. Ukraine will be winning, and the whole free world will be winning. So it's it's a very long process. Uh, and we can we can discuss what what, what it's, a, it's a great uh, question for me. What does it mean? What does it mean? What what victory of Ukraine and over the whole free world against Russia? Uh, the victory against Russia mean? Yeah, I, I don't know now. Yeah, but I am sure that it's a very long process, and not for all, not only for politicians, not only for the military people. But also for philosophers, for writers, for history, for 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 scientists, for for all of us, mm. all over the world, and it's also a new a new experience, a new knowledge for our, for all of us because we so it's 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 the nature of a human being to to dream about peace, to dream about the normal life, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very dangerous to think that it come. In, in few days or in few months or in, even in few years, call this danger or this, as I call it, Russia's shadow of civilization is near us, and we feel it. Yeah, and this process is very long. Yeah. And I think we will definitely get into that as well in, when we discuss the future. How will a future coexistence, not just for Ukraine, but for all of Europe, uh, look like Absolutely. with this aggressor? Uh, now, Katarina, of course, being specialized in security uh, policy, uh, it feels to many of us as if the entire geopolitical uh, structure of Europe was uprooted uh, by the events on February 24, by the invasion, as something that had been constructed and uh, stabilized, if you will, over the decades uh, since uh, the end of the Second World War. <coughs> Do you think that that common description and that feeling is correct? Or was the geopolitical order of Europe actually shakier uh, than we thought? I somehow, uh, I'm, I'm opposing that description because it says that the Euro European, uh, the common phrase that is being used is that the European security architecture is under attack or has been ruptured. Uh, but if you look at it, I mean, Ukraine has been in war since 2014 and Russia invaded Georgia in 2008. These are European countries. There was an ongoing war, and there were, I mean, destabilizing actions in Moldova as well. Uh, there was already an ongoing war in several, uh, in Ukraine, and there had been invasions of other countries. So I sort of struggle to say that one year ago was the defining actor. But I think that it was definitely the yet, even though the European security order had been under attack and rupture and was sort of allowed to continue to be under attack, uh, we definitely saw the dawn of a new Europe uh, on um, 
from February 24th. And it was a Europe that very re reluctantly, a Europe and the West that very reluctantly woke up to the understanding that we're in a new phase. Uh, freedom is not for free. It actually takes defending. And this was something that most European countries really struggled to realize and didn't want to realize. They wanted to continue as previously. They wanted to continue trade with Russia. Uh, they wanted to continue to trade with strategic products with Russia, even though we saw, I mean, all the information that we needed to see that this was not a good idea uh, was already there. Uh, but, but after February 24th, it was definitely impossible to, to continue in that stance. So, so in that sense, it wasn't a, it was sort of a new dawn for Europe, yes. Mm. And Julia, I'm wondering, since you specialize in memory and also the politics of memory, have we sort of taken freedom and democracy for granted? How, how fragile would you say Western democracy is? Uh, as a historian, I would say that um, this war and um, like the history shows that everything is not really for granted. We shouldn't take anything for granted because if we speak about democracy, even in Sweden, we celebrated this kind of uh, as hundred years of democracy last year, right? Uh, because women got. Um, uh, voting rights a uh, hundred years ago. So this uh, period in history is really very short and it, uh, it, it, it is uh, very short in terms of history and it shows us that it is very fragile now. So I think that uh, the world just shows Europe and all the democracies that uh, democracy is under attack and uh, uh, we shouldn't take both peace and democracy for granted. And uh, I think what is uh, interesting is that um, Vaktan said that uh, he was not like dealing with war, but he's living in the war now. And uh, I'm a, a historian and I was trained like into the war, like history is the war, 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 and I'm a historian of the Second World War and a lot of uh, like war in my uh, education and training. And uh, uh, and I am a Ukrainian who didn't experience the war. So I mean Sweden in the safe place, so to say. My experience of war is very different from Vaktang. But uh, I, what I can say is that all my world was shattered, really shattered, on the day of 24th of February last year. So I can understand that for people there on the ground, it's really the new reality they woke up to. Mm. And uh, uh, I do agree with Kater uh, Katerina that um, um, Europe, uh, because of this war, it uh, could see itself as an actor, mm. like uh, to, to claim its own subjectivity and, and see that uh, this is a new stage in history we are in. Mm. And uh, I just uh, uh, remember just recently I read uh, an article of the theoretician of war and he is uh, specializing on uh, uh, termination of war theory and uh, uh, he wrote um, his uh, uh, um, good, uh, what is his name? I just want to say because it was really good, like uh, Hein Goemann, and he said that this war will shape the rest of the 21st century. If Russia wins, then we will have just totally different world, and if Russia loses, we will de we will have totally different Russia. And I do agree that we will have totally different world after this war and the outcomes of the war will distinguish which kind of world we will be living. We will be living in kind of democracies we were building for these hundred of years or it will be the world of totally different order with kind of despotism, authoritarianism, which will become a norm. Mm. And you say you didn't experience the war, but did you expect the war, the invasion? Uh, this is a tricky question because I was telling everyone that the war won't come, but I was writing in all my diaries every day that the war is coming. Yeah. Mm. And Torbjörn, 
it's really interesting to hear your economic perspective here because not least in Western media uh, there is a huge uh, focus almost since the invasion began last year on the economics of war. What is it costing us? What is the price? Um, is it too expensive? And we have to think about our own finances and so on. And there really seems to be rather crudely a price uh, for freedom and for solidarity. Is that the correct way of, uh, of going about this? Well, I, I think we all agree, first of all, that human lives are not something we want to put the price on. I know that people do that also in the economic science, but it's really not, not sort of a question that we have to ask ourselves. It's basically the price of defending the life of, of yourself and your family and your friends. That's infinity, basically. So from, from that perspective, it always becomes a little bit shallow when we discuss how many dollars do we need to put into this war and how many guns do we need to buy or rockets or whatever. Um, but of course I'm an economist so I do sit down and look at the numbers and, and think about how much money did we in Europe or in the collective West uh, invest in, in the future of Ukraine so far. And, and you know it, it's quite shocking how small these numbers are when we put them in perspective. Uh, I can just mention one number here maybe is that the European Union has committed, still not paid, but committed something in the order of 50 billion US dollars, military, humanitarian and, and financial support to Ukraine. 50 billion US dollars is a number that's almost meaningless to most of us because it, it's just so big that you know, I cannot relate to what that means for me. But So if we just compare it to some some magnitudes that we think about, you know, it's yeah, it's a quarter of GDP of, of Ukraine's GDP before the war. So in that sense, it's a big number. But the thing is that Ukraine, compared to the economies of Europe or the collective West, was a tiny economy also before the war. So if we put it in perspective of how much is it for EU countries collectively? It's 0.3% of our collective GDP, okay? It's maybe 6, 7, 8% of what the European countries are paying in energy subsidies to our households and companies right now. And it's maybe a couple of percent compared to what we're now thinking that we need ourselves to invest in our, our military defense. You know, we're all saying that pretty much every country in Europe is thinking about to increase military expenditure by 1% of GDP. And you know, this is not the one-shot investment, this is forever, basically. So if you add these numbers up, it means that these 50 billion US dollars that we have committed to Ukraine uh, is just a tiny fraction of all the relevant other ways I can think about, you know, what this is really about. So, from my perspective, I, I think we really have some homework to do in terms of explaining uh, to people here, to sort of voters in different parts of Europe, that this is like the most valuable investment in our own future that we can do. Because we are all affected by this, and as we have said, if Russia wins this war, everything changes. Not only for Ukraine, but also for us. So I think, again, uh, the economic price is just a, a tiny, tiny thing uh, in comparison. And let's talk about that more in detail. What is actually the price? for not supporting Ukraine, instead of always looking at how much does this airplane cost or, or this particular tank, uh, what would be the price? And I think, uh, Katerina, what happens to a Russia that is awarded by, for example, uh, a part of Ukraine, a part of Crimea, uh, that actually sees the benefits of invading another European country? 
I just want to thank Tobiard for, for making this comparison because as you say 50 billion US dollars that sounds like a lot but it's hard to grasp when you start putting it in context and just to start with commenting on that I think that West Europe has done a, a, a great deal since the war started for some countries it's been astonishing I mean we've been experiencing the, the political turnarounds in our own countries almost surreal but I don't think we yet have understood that we have to bear, and if we put it bluntly, economic costs for freedom. We have not, I don't think that that realization is quite sinking in yet. And I think that some, some politicians in some countries are explaining it better than others. I actually think that our own defense minister, Paul Jonsson, explained it very well in Salat the other month when he well, he, he, he talked about the Swedish support that is now amongst the top five uh, supporters uh, of Ukraine. And he said that our support <coughs> will come at, at an economic cost and will have implications for our own defense capabilities. But it's a small price to pay compared to the sacrificing blood that Ukraine makes every day. And we need more explanations like that. Uh, because yes, it's an economic cost, but what is the cost of not doing so? And that understanding has not, is just starting to be shaped. And in order to sort of arrive there, we have to ask ourselves out loud, okay, what, does, what does it mean to not stand up for Ukraine? What does a, vic a Russian victory look like? And what are the consequences of such victory? And if you pose those questions, we, we all start, you know, we, we start to get a picture of, you know, Russia being involved and starting to continue the, the horrific things it's doing in Ukraine, just being involved and empowered to continue doing them. And it's, it's not a very pretty picture, and therefore I think there's a certain reluctancy mm -hmm. towards that. But uh, we have to talk about it more loudly, and uh, if not else, in sort of a pedagogical sense to be able to maintain and significantly increase the aid and support to Ukraine right now. Um, and to sort of make the understanding that this is truly the battle of our time, this is the battle of our generation of decades to come that is being fought right now. And Julia, of <coughs> course, as a historian, uh, you are living <laughs> in this uh, very important historical moment Looking at Sweden's history, uh, we were, I mean, neutral <laughs> like this with the quotation marks. Uh, some would say we have perhaps put our head in the sand. Uh, we have um, tried to defend our own territorial integrity by, for example, allowing uh, German soldiers to pass through on the way to occupy Norway. We have not uh, got a particularly strong history of European solidarity in the last couple of decades. Um, will we be able to make the right decision based on that history? Uh, what uh, surprises me really that uh, Sweden reacted really well um, to, to the war. So they understood the whole threat and uh, the seriousness of the situation. And, um, I just hope that it will continue because uh, I think for Sweden, exactly because of its history, it was a huge, huge step towards NATO, for instance. It's an identical, like this is the question of identity and Swedish people were ready to do it. So we don't know how it will end, right? But uh, even this movement, it also shows that even Sweden, so it also shows the uh, threat and the seriousness of the situation because even Sweden was ready to become a NATO member. So I think it uh, tells us a lot. And I just wanted to tell about this prize of, um, uh, of uh, democracy, prize of uh, victory. And we thought about it and we talked about it in the last uh, panel about this uh, importance of words, right? And um, what Vaktang said about this victory and uh, oh, peace and like, what the Ukrainian will be winning, like. And I think that uh, uh, in, uh, in the European Union now, and it is also shown in the different surveys that uh, 
people generally support Ukraine, but there are kind of two uh, camps, like the people who want the peace, whatever, what it takes, just peace and that's it. And another camp is uh, the justice peace, uh, justice camp. And I think that um, uh, in July or June, there was a very good article of uh, Bulgarian intellectual uh, Ivan Krastev, and he wrote about these two camps. And uh, for him it was, uh, and he had all this service data and everything, and for him it was really essential to show that uh, what these people really want, they want to live in democracies, they want to have uh, the life they have, but what is important to convey, to articulate to them, that this is not about like the victory, whatever it takes, because, um, or peace, whatever it takes, because uh, if, um, it will be this kind of protracted war, or if it will be this protracted threat, they will never have this life which they are uh, wanting to have. So, and uh, in this service it shows that it's only in Poland where uh, this is the only country in the European Union, as he writes, where this uh, justice camp it prevails. Uh, other countries are more into this kind of thinking, peace wherever it takes, and uh, it seems like uh, this kind of information is really um, uh, faulty because people don't understand that peace doesn't mean that they will have uh, democracies forever or this kind of uh, peaceful life forever, because exactly the peace um, on uh, Russian terms, for instance, it doesn't really mean peace. It, it doesn't mean peaceful coexistence. Mm -hmm. This is so important to discuss, Vartan, from a, not just uh, from a Ukrainian, but from a philosophical perspective as well. Peace or justice uh, or both. What, do, what are your thoughts about this? I would, I would say both. Of yes. course, yeah, because we need peace. As, uh, without peace we cannot live. But we cannot live uh, without justice as well. And uh, it's a very difficult to, to combine these two notions yeah, in the modern world. Uh, but I would say, without, uh, without justice, we will not have any peace. Yeah? Uh, that's why we, we need justice in this world. Because or we, we will have another, another, another kind of world, as you say. That, uh, of, of, after, uh, I, I, I don't want to, to, to speak uh, absolutely about the victory of Russia. Yeah, for me it's impossible. Because it's not another world. It's not my world. In this world, I, 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 I don't want to live in the world where it's possible that so terrible country, probably not country, so terrible territory, win. Yeah, it's, not, it's not my world. Yeah, it's not my world. It's not well, the world for my children. It's not the world for the, for the new generation. Yeah, and that's why we should say about, about this very difficult combination of peace and justice and uh, the, uh, the, the um, philosophical horizon for it, in the, in the, the theory of values. Yeah. So we, we should say, we should sit, speak about the values, and we should speak not, uh, not only about the peace and justice. We should speak about freedom. We should speak about dignity. The name of our revolution. Yes. It was the beginning of the, the of this part of story. Yeah. The name of our revolution it was the revolution of dignity. Yeah, and it, it was very bad for Russia, because the Russian society, the society without dignity without freedom, without dignity, and our dignity mm, impossible in the world where Russia win. That's why we, we should speak about the many different European values, freedom, justice, peace, dignity. And uh, we should ask ourselves, uh, are we really want to live in the world without war, but without dignity, without freedom, and uh, okay, the Russians say to us, and all authoritarian uh, regimes say, it, we should, we should, uh, we should, we, we we buy your freedom for security. Yeah? Another very important value is security. Yeah? We all need security in, in all dimensions of our life. But I would say the people who lost the freedom, 
they will lose their security in the future because it's a manipulation yeah? and it's the main manipulation of Russia they said for us we can we can organize the world without freedom yeah, but uh, but but it will it will it will be we will be we will uh, uh, live in security mm. but it is impossible absolutely so we know we we are free people and we are know that we cannot live in the world without freedom because the world without freedom means the world without dignity without justice without security and it's not uh, I would say uh, in this world uh, the life is impossible. And when we, uh, we are hearing now the, the, main, the main messages of Russian uh, propaganda, uh, they say life, life is not a value. Yeah? The, the death, yeah, it's okay for us. The death is okay. Yeah? The first one and then another one, oh, happiness. Happiness is not a value. We should be unhappy. But all our civilization is based on this idea of happiness. It's idea by Aristoteles. Without, for, for, so, uh, for what we are living here, for for what we are, we are waiting, what kind of life we are waiting for our children in this in this, uh, in this world, uh, death, unhappiness, security without freedom. Do we really want to in the in the world like that? I am not. So it's not only the question of uh, victory of Ukraine or the, or, or the victory of Western civilization in this war. I think that it's a question about the victory of mankind. For me, Russia is the enemy of mankind. Yeah? It's, a, it's, a real, it's a real illness of, of our human being. And we should do something with that. And after the victory also, we should, we should think about that. What should we do after that with the oldest people? Yeah? And for that, and probably it's a question to, his, uh, to, to the history. Yeah? Because we, we, and it was also, I think, the topic of the first discussion about these narrations in, in, in history, in literature. Uh, we uh, often used the old name. And these old names, uh, old names, and these old names come very often from Russian narration. One small example. I discussed the whole situation with my friend from Germany. He's a musician. He's for us, yeah. And he he knows very well the history of Eastern Europe. And we discussed not only the presents, but we discussed the past as well. And suddenly he said, "Okay, yeah, I know the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century. It was a civil war in your country." I said, "No, it was not civil war." It was our war against Russia. It was war, the Ukrainian war against Russia, and it was a surprise for him, yeah, because he is not for Russia. He doesn't speak Russian, but his narration is Russian narration. So to understand the present and to see the perspective of future, we should re-articulate our past. We should find the new narrations in philosophy, in history. In economics, probably I don't know. In the sphere of security, uh, in politics, yeah, we should we should rearticulate the whole history, not only of the 20th century. Because very often we use the Russian narrations, not only in Russia, not only in Russia, not only in Ukraine, but also here in Europe, in Germany, for example, or in Spain, or in even in, in the United States. And Julia, isn't it true that also the Russian narrative that they were the sole victors of the Second World War has also inspired today's propaganda, this uh, fake news and lies about uh, Ukraine being overrun by Nazis, yeah. so saying that it's a continuation of this strange uh, anti-Nazi narrative which is based on, on lies. But uh, uh, this is indeed how Russia is using this history, history of um, the, the end of the Second World War and they, that they were they are, uh, the only victors and uh, in the last uh, um, 
speech of Putin, for instance, he did, um, uh, and he just mentioned that it was only Russia who won the war, and everyone was uh, against the Russia. He, like, he, he, he even mentioned that the whole West was against Russia. But uh, I mean, uh, what about Alice? What about like history, right? And uh, of course, this is all about this narrative. And Andrei uh, mentioned this uh, speech uh, Putin first had before invading uh, Ukraine, and it was about this unity, like Im Im imagined unity uh, in uh, Putin's head uh, with uh, Ukraine and Russia. And uh, now this imagination is just growing wild, and uh, he's uh, openly saying that this is exactly the war of Russia against the West, and it was exactly the same when uh, we were uh, fighting in the Second World War. But what is very uh, dangerous here, that this kind of um, appropriation of victory, it has uh, very practical um, implications, because Germany, it seems that Germany really internalized this feeling of guilt only uh, against uh, uh, Russia, but not against other countries. And uh, uh, I think that many of you read uh, Bloodlands of uh, Timothy Snyder, where he shows that uh, uh, the main battles were of the Second World War were actually on the ground of Ukraine and Belarus and uh, Eastern Europe. It was not a Russian ground. And if we talk about the Soviet army, it was more than five million Ukrainians only in the Red Army. So this was this was the. Uh, victory of the Soviet Union and the Ukraine was the part of Soviet Union and it was the victory of the allies. So without allies it won't be the victory. So this is just very, very uh, strange uh, image of the history uh, Putin has and then it's also Russians who kind of internalize it. What do the rest of you think of this ongoing parallel sort of battle of ideas, the battle of the narrative of uh, your vision of Europe? What do you think of that? Well, I mean, it's so much propaganda now all over the place. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the economic discussions, in particular then the, the things around sanctions and how sanctions work or not on the Russian economy. And, <clears throat> it's just so filled with different stories of how this is not the problem, etc., uh, etc. Et it's quite obvious it is the problem for Russia, but you know they tell the stories that this is not the problem. But you know <coughs> fundamentally, every time I hear Putin, Lavrov, Peskov, any one of these guys saying something, you know it's 99% lies, and then they put some percent of truth that someone can catch on to and then turn it around and make the rest of the 99% of lies still not imagination. So I mean, it's quite shocking when you see how many people buy into that kind of uh, fake story, fake news kind of narrative that you see. I would like to comment. So we use this notion propaganda, but it's not really correct. Because I, I think about all this book by Peter Pomeranz, you know this guy from, uh, from Great Britain, but he's from Ukraine at first. Uh, and uh, this book, uh, Nothing is True, Everything is Possible, yeah. uh, about the Russian so-called propaganda. And Peter, he is absolutely right, I think, then uh, he said that it's, it's not correct to, to describe this situation in, in, uh, in Russia with the, uh, the notion of propaganda. Because propaganda, it's, uh, the pro propaganda is instrument. It's not bad or good. Yeah? Propaganda is promotion. Promotion of different ideas. Yeah? Of, of, uh, ideas can be good or can be bad. For example, propaganda of uh, Nazism, communism is bad. Propaganda of uh, human rights is good. Yeah? And that's why Peter called, uh, called this, uh, this process psychological informational war. And not only against, against Georgia or Ukraine, but against the, the whole free world. And the main goal of this psychological international war is to show that there is not truth in this world. Everybody lies. Not only Putin or um, Peskov. Everybody lies. That's why everything is possible. We can say, today we can say that, 
another day we can say something others and that's why it's, it's everything, open, everything is possible in this world and it's very dangerous because it's not about propaganda it's about real psychological information war and I would uh, say something about this narration about Second World War it's very good that we don't use now this, uh, this Russian notion great patriotic war uh, they use the, 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 the and if you, if you are in the Russian, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that the most uh, <coughs> people in Russia they they, they think that uh, this war began in 1941, not in 1939. It's very important. So it, it's it's also about the narrations. And I have another question, not about only uh, Red Army. We. I don't think, I didn't know why, but even the, uh, the, the, the scientists in Ukraine, we don't uh, discuss this problem uh, of uh, so-called Vlasov army. Vlasov army is it's Russian army, the Second World War, and this army was alliance of, of Hitler. And it was Russian army. It's, uh, only Russians uh, were there, and it, it was approximately from 50, hundred thousand to, to millions of people who fight who fight it on the side of, of Hitler. Yeah. And it's yeah of course it's very unpopular in Russia to say about that. But why we don't discuss this this issue? And uh, after after Stockholm I I go to France and I I see the roots of this Vlasov army in this first wave of so called white immigration. Yeah? And white immigration is very popular in France, for example. Yeah, there were excellent people, philosophers and writers, but there were many representatives of of was this white guard, and they also were uh, was uh, they also were our 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 enemies in this uh, first so-called civil war. But it was the war at the beginning of the 20th century. It was the war of Ukraine against Russia, and. And I, 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 I see the direct connection between this first uh, first wave of Russian immigration in France, for example, or in Germany, and this last army in the Second World War. But I, it's, it's also a question for you. Why we don't discuss this? this so we discuss it in yeah? history, right? Sure. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. but you are absolutely <clears throat> right that this is not a part of any kind of collective memory of Russians. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But in Ukraine, I, I think you also know. No. Or not? No, no. Uh, or in Europe. It's, it's a question for you all, yeah. Because yeah. I, I see that in France, for example, this uh, this legend of this of these uh, victims of the communi communists, uh, the, this wave of white guard, yeah, this, this this name of the novel by Mikhail Bulgakov, white guard, it's like a legend about the very uh, good people, but it's not the truth. Yeah. Katrina. Oh, we have a school class running through oh, the yeah. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> very happy. Yes. Uh, but your microphone is very loud. Yes. So I, I will so you talk louder than the, than the happy kids. No, but a, but a comment about history. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen in Russia and very consciously during the Putin regime is an active use of history and a weaponization of history. I want to recommend the brilliant report that was published for us by, by Gunnar Passion that actually touches upon this, how the use of history has been weaponized. And I think in Sweden, and you ask a historical question, uh, in Sweden it's, it's very hard to relate to this, because I think we are exceptionally unhistoric. And we are unhistoric because we have allowed ourselves to have bad knowledge of history, um, wrongfully so, I'd say, but because we have had peace for 200 years. So we have sort of started to think that history doesn't matter. And we have seen this weaponization of history for a long time in Russia. There have been various uses of, I mean, in, in propaganda, or, or you can call it someone, something else, but in, in making fun of Swedes, that we are tough on Russia because we're angry about uh, Poltava, or you know, these type of historical references that just sort of fly above our heads. I mean, silly Russians, they care so much about history and everything. But this has been another tough lesson mm -hmm. for Sweden to learn that history matters and it can be used and misused in a profound way that we are seeing now. 
and when it comes to, to propaganda and, and disinformation and, and the psychological war. Psychological warfare, exactly, that's what it's about, and also weaponization of information and of misinformation that has been used. If there is one upside to this war, I don't want to say upside generally, but it is that the, that the spread of the sort of overall Russian narrative, or nothing is true, uh, uh, relativization, what, what about this, it's commonly called, it doesn't fly as good. In, in Europe and the West, it does in some circles, but it's considered to be very fringe and rather extreme. Before, it was rather mainstream to say, but mm, doesn't Russia have a point here? And you know, it's never one's uh, just one's fault when there's a conflict, and so that, that's not mainstream anymore. That's a good thing. It's much more hard to spread these type of narratives now. It's been a very painful sort of coming back to reality. <coughs> Very much so. And I just want to go back quickly to Torbjörn. Uh, I understand you as sanctions do work because we need to speak a bit about now um, how Europe should relate and respond to the aggressor. Of course, except the military. I think the military front is a given, so we will not even touch upon it here. But you believe sanctions are effective. Should they be much graver? Well, I mean, First of all, we introduce sanctions <clears throat> at a relatively slow pace, to be honest. And, and the most effective sanctions when it comes to Russia is, of course, the ones that are targeting oil and gas exports. Because that's where they make most of their money, basically. It, it supports 40 to 50 percent of the government's budget that comes from that. And it's uh, maybe 60, 70 percent of export revenues is also related yeah. to to energy exports. So, you know, it's, it's not hard to figure out what we should target with sanctions, but of course, a lot of countries in Europe uh, had a great degree of dependency on importing this energy, not least Germany, but it's, it's actually quite interesting to see how it differed among European countries. So, you know, the fact that it took some time to agree on these sanctions is not so surprising when we look at sort of who's importing what and how different it looks across countries in Europe. We may want to think in the future about maybe more solidarity when it comes to, you know, okay, I agree on sanctions, but you pay me a little bit of money to put up with the suffering because I'm the one suffering from the sanctions, you know. We could maybe be a little bit more clever in Europe. On the other hand, you know, if we think about Germany, I think a lot of us think that Germany was extremely naive when it really built its whole energy supply on Russia. You know, that was the ultimate test of, of you know, going for all, all the false things that were promised. But were they naive or were they not just very greedy? No, but I mean, you, both. you cannot be greedy if you think it's going to develop the way it did. It, it's just stupid. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's not smart. No. You know, now they had to fix everything in a very short time period, you know. That, that's not greed, that's not planning right, you know. So it's basically not thinking about what are the consequences if we misjudge this particular supplier of something that is critically important to the entire society. And you know, do you really want to rely on a regime that's not democratic for something like this? Probably not. So, but anyway, I think now we are at the phase when, when the energy sanctions are coming into force. This is seriously going to limit the war chest of Putin. Uh, when we add also sanctions on what we export to Russia, that, that impacts what they can actually produce for the military and, in, and for other industries. You know? so I, Yes, I think sanctions will have a much bigger bite this year than last year. Interesting. So when it comes to some of the forecasts, just to finish on that, uh, on the Russian economy for this year, the IMF, for example, put up the forecast, Russia will grow with 0.3%. I think it's completely wrong. Uh, I think it completely underestimates the fact that now is the year when the energy sanctions come into force. That was not last year. 
you know. So I think if if I was the minister of finance in Russia, I would not sleep so well at night. <laughs> no. Just, uh, yeah, ju just a short comment to, put, to follow up on, on Germany and the gas supply. It's, uh, today it's often, you know, it's popular to explain various decisions with naivety, but all the information was there. And when it comes to Germany, the, the, the experts and experts and the policymakers across the world said, don't do this, don't do it, you know. But they decided to do it anyway. Uh, so I don't think it can be explained with naivety. I also I agree with with um, with Tudman that, that greed is not a good explanation because it's such a risk. And look look at the situation we're in now. But uh, uh, maybe Julia can explain the the mechanisms better. It has historical reasons and emotional ones that are you know that make sort of rational decisions cloud the, the judgments for. Julia, for what you things. say? So it's not greed. It's not naivety. Could it be fear? It can be everything, right? It can all be all thoughts. of these factors together. Some but historical I, also, give, but give I think perception. that historically it's uh, also the way Germany is building its uh, politics towards um, Russia and the East. Because even uh, in uh, Ostpolitik after uh, the war, it was really like um, going over the heads of all the East European heads just directly to Moscow because they were <coughs> so afraid of Moscow and also having all these guilt feelings against Moscow. And then also it, um, uh, th there is this um, kind of infamous um, a phrase of one of the architects of this Ostpolitik after the Second World War, uh, when um, uh, Egon Bar, when he said that um, uh, freedom is the wichtiger uh, as um, uh, Poland, uh, as well, uh, uh, um, <laughs> peace is uh, more important than Poland. So it shows how kind of this. Uh, thinking is um, kind of uh, incriminated into the uh, um, politics of Germany. And uh, I think this is really everything together. This is uh, enormous uh, economical benefits. This is, and this is something what Pet Peter Pomerantsev writes also, that you cannot imagine this wealth and riches when it comes to these elites in Russia and how alluring it is, how easy it is to fall into this trap, to, to really have this desire. And desire is a very powerful mechanism for us human beings. And uh, it's all together. This is this kind of past dependency, Ostpolitik, uh, and uh, um, and also po uh, kind of um, positive thinking, thinking that oh Russia will be better even if we kind of play that we are blind for something like uh, we we just um, close our eyes and just pretend we don't see and maybe it will be good but uh, uh, but reality is harsher. Mm. So it's kind of a combination. I would say that some kind of primitive Marxism. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, of course, uh, Marxists uh, think that the economical interests are the substructure of the society. And that's why it was idea, post-politic, you know, it was the idea that when we have the uh, common economical interests with Russia, it will be everything okay. Yeah? But it's wrong, because the economical interests are not the substructure of of, of the human being, and we, we see that uh, why we, why many experts say that it's impossible that Russia comes to Ukraine, because uh, it, it's not good for Russia. It's not good in, in economical from an economical point of view. But probably there are many other motives in the human human behavior uh, aside of uh, just economical. Uh, Interest. And that was the main, as for me, it was the main philosophical, so to speak, philosophical mistake of this post politique. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we can have a whole panel where we discuss Europe's historical mistakes in dealing with <coughs> Russia, and Londongrad, of course, is another example of uh, where London has basically been bought up uh, by uh, Putin and the, the oligarchs, which Catherine Belton has written. Uh, so well about. But I think we'll be talking for about just 15-20 more minutes and then we'll let the audience in. So we have to focus a bit on the future now. And please give me your thoughts on how Ukraine and Europe, after Ukrainian victory, will be able to coexist with this aggressor that has committed such uh, atrocious war crimes. Uh, 
I mean, I suppose justice, a proper trial, a criminal court sending um, decision makers to The Hague would be the first step. But how will a peaceful coexistence with Russia even be possible in our lifetimes, all of us sitting here? What would you think? I think that it is impossible. Yeah, the peaceful coexistence with Russia is impossible. It's a great illusion. That's why I would say that it's, it's a terrible thing, but the only one way it's, if it's possible, the peaceful destruction of Russian Empire. It's only one way to peace, to justice, to freedom, to dignity for all these values that is very important for us. And it's a very big and dangerous mistake to try uh, to see our future coexistence with Russia. No, it's impossible. And how do you mean on a practical level, the division of Russia into separate republics? I don't know, it's, it's a question for, for politicians, it's a question for, for military people also, for, for, for the experts all for, from the economics, I don't know, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I can, uh, I'm not expert on, on all of this field, but I'm absolutely sure that, it impo it, it, as I say, it is, it is a very great illusion. That it's it's possible to live with Russia in peace. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. And uh, I wrote the text in German. Uh, we, we we should try to 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 speak about our future. We should describe our presence. <coughs> and for for me, yes, for example, it's very complicated to to describe this war, to this to this period of war. What 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 is, what, what what's the name of this war? Invasion, or what what, what another 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 word? Uh, but in this article, I, uh, I wrote that we should we should ask another question. The beginning of this war. The beginning of this war is 24 February of uh, 2022. 20, uh, yeah. No. 2014. 2014. Or probably the whole 20th century, or the war. The Russian war against the free world, or probably the whole history of Russia, it was it was the history of the war. And if we understand our past, we can describe our presence, and we can try to think about our future. And if we, if we understand that the, the uh, modus vivendi of Russia is the war, we should understand that it's impossible to live with with Russia in peace. Yes, no, I, I want to pick up on what uh, Bakhtan is saying. Is a, it's an important understanding. It's If I can refer once again to Gudra Passion, she, she is after all the first, the foremost Russia expert we have in Sweden, but she, she was asked this very question at the last <coughs> Schwar Society and Defense Conference uh, in January this year. Uh, peaceful, it was the exact title, Peaceful Existence with Russia. Is it possible? She entered the stage and said, I've been asked to answer this question, to have a speech, and the answer is no. She gathered her papers and <laughs> sort of acted like she was going out, and, and then she came back. It was a joke, but, yeah. but no, essentially, peaceful coexistence, it sort of refers to the idea that there's some sort of going back. And there is no going back after this. There is no, you know... Okay, the war ends and then we go back to normal, but that's not going to happen. Uh, there will be no you know, relations as they were before, trade-wise or diplomatically. It's not going to happen. So in that sense, peaceful coexistence, no, it's not possible. Uh, Gudrun also pointed in her speech to the very term peaceful coexistence was coined in Soviet mm -hmm. as sort of... A, the same way they coined the, the, you know, the, the Baltic Sea, the Sea of Peace, because they had an idea that they would control it. Peaceful coexistence means the Soviet Union being able to control their neighbors on their terms. Mm -hmm. So no, th there will be no peaceful coexistence. There might be, when Ukraine wins, the absence of war. But it doesn't mean that the coexistence will be peaceful. It means long-term containment and managing the fact that we have a dangerous neighbor in our vicinity, in Europe's vicinity, uh, as the neighbor of Ukraine and as the neighbor of Sweden. Uh, and that is something that will have to be dealt with. 
and and it's hard to see that that Europe and the West, even after you know Putin is gone, it, why would it be better? Uh, there's nothing pointing to that, and sadly, I mean, there would have to be a significant, not only regime shift, but shift of the entire society in a democratic uh, uh, way that that we have so far not seen. So I think that we will have to learn from the fact that Russia even when it loses, will be a very uncomfortable and dangerous neighbor for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. And Julia, just not to end on a hopeless note, <laughs> just a little bit more hope. Um, tell us about the historical parallels, for example, to the Nuremberg trials, because if you do go back uh, into the newspaper archives, what was written was that Germany uh, will always be a danger. I'm not saying uh, that there are parallels. I do believe that Russia is a large danger, but it was very much a black and white uh, vision, and people did not think it was possible uh, for Germany ever to, to come out as a fully democratized society after the, the horrific uh, Holocaust and its war crimes. In what part did the Nuremberg uh, trials play into that? I, I think that uh, I, I do agree that in the form what Russia is now, it's not possible to have any kind of uh, existence. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, if um, all the crimes are punished, as, um, and also if um, the, uh, and in German case there was kind of um, management and administration of all these zones uh, in uh, Germany and uh, this kind of settlement maybe this is the way for Russia as well like uh, uh, the West will control different zones of uh, Russia but what is needed this kind of um, grassroots understanding and uh, repentance for all these crimes uh, uh, committed for in their name but uh, i don't see any kind of movement in russia that they come to this kind of uh, feeling guilty feeling ashamed and feeling like we want to ask for forgiveness because this is what is what what was uh, um, kind of seen in Germany after the war, uh, but just because uh, thanks to the trials and thanks to this uh, uh, administration from outside. Mm. Yes. I, I have a positive answer, but not like, you know, not like probably as philosopher, but like a poet. Yeah, uh, I think that imagination is a very important factor of our historical process. And I absolutely agree with Benedict Anderson, I think that's very important. Uh, book, you know, these imagined communities uh, and their main, 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 main slogan is this book, Nations are Narrations, yeah? because yeah, and the social imaginations is very important, so we should imagine the future world, so we should imagine it, yeah? in Ukraine, in Sweden, in Europe, in USA, and what should be the object of this imagination? <laughs> I, 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 I found the answer in Izu, you know, this small, small town near Kharkiv. We were there after the occupation, yeah, we were in this cemetery, this terrible cemetery <coughs> where many soldiers and civil people were killed by Russians, tortured, killed and buried. And uh, almost the whole town is d destroyed. And we found there the building with a great painting, mural, yeah. It was a portrait of John Lennon. Mm -hmm. yes. And it was a quotation from his well known some image. Yeah, you you understand. Yeah? Imagine all the people living in the world agree. And this portrait was destroyed by the Russian shelling. Mm -hmm. And I think we should put this portrait of Lennon, destroyed by the Russian shelling all over the world with another word. Imagine world without Russia. Let's start. 
It's, it's good ending note on this is the name of this conference is Ukraine Vision. So we need to have, uh, but, but this is absolutely correct. And this is when, when, you, when you speak about morale and about the will to defense and civilian resilience, it's exactly what you say, that the need for a vision uh, to strive for an imaginary goal is so important to be able to visualize it in order to keep up uh, the morale, not least uh, within the civilian population. No, I just wanted to say, we, if we think about this on a kind of sad or realistic level, with 6,000 nuclear warheads in Russia, this change will have to come from within Russia. You know, it, we cannot go full out war with Russia, given this, so you know. But in, in some sense, the only solution to living peacefully with Russia is, of course, if people in Russia decide that this is not the way to continue their history and they, they agree with the West to have some sort of disarmament that makes them, you know, not a nuclear power that can always threaten the whole world. I mean, that's the only realistic solution. You know, as long as they have all of these nukes there, it's not realistic to think that we can you know, have them at the Nuremberg trial and they will all, you know, think differently. This has to come from within Russia, I think. But the passiveness uh, and uh, complacency within the Russian civilian population is, is hugely problematic, which so many people have written about, Peter Pomerantz uh, as well. Uh, what would it take then for, uh, for the Russians to awaken to these horrors that are being committed in their names? I'm afraid without um, external pressure there won't come any change. I would say that illness, the social illness, is the core of Russian identity. That's why I, I'm not, I'm not think, I don't think that it's, 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 it's really, really possible to wait the changing between inside Russia. And I am realistic and I, I, I absolutely sure that it is impossible. And probably we we need this pressure, not not only military pressure, but economical, intellectual, political pressure to change this territory and, and to change the people who live there. Because when I say that we, we should imagine the, the world without Russia, I don't say that we should imagine the world without Russian people. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like it's, 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 another, it's, another, it's another scenario of future. Yeah. Yeah, I think about the uh, Soviet Union and what was yeah, uh, this pressure. Yeah. It was kind of uh, impossibility to travel. It was the impossibility to buy. Uh, th this was uh, this really restrictions into uh, consumerism because people desire things, and if they don't w have these things, maybe this will influence them. Inconveniences, uh, yeah, daily lives, just being uncomfortable, and the uh, impossibility to travel anywhere, to go to uh, Los Angeles and have all this beautiful life there as they used to have. Mm. And it's also the instrument to find the good Russians. Yeah, we, we, we try to find the good Russians. For me it's impossible now, but I find one question for the people from Russia. Uh, so, about imagination. Yeah? Can you imagine the world without Russia? It's a question also for Russian people. If they say to me, or he or she said, yeah, okay, I can imagine it. That is the starting point for, 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 the, for, for the discussion. But try to, to, to do it. <laughs> you, you, you will find nobody. I'm absolutely, now you will, you will find nobody. And I, 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 th I think that I can say, uh, say it, because I was born in Soviet Union. I hated Soviet Union. Yeah? And the great dream of my life was the destruction of Soviet Union. So, why the Russian people cannot imagine the world without Russia? It's a freedom for them. It's a, it's a free. It's a justice for them. It's a dignity for them. Like for me, who was born in Soviet Union, who hated his own motherland, and it's a great trauma for for me. But it was my dream. It was dream of my childhood, 
and now I am free and I have the dignity. So it's a solution for Russian people also. Katarina, is there anything we can learn from the collapse of the Soviet Union? My long silence <laughs> sort of interprets that. Uh, no, but it's, it's very hard to see how, how this is going to sort of go in, in the right direction for Russia. It's, uh, it's as Tobian pointed to, it's, it really takes change from Russia. And sadly, I mean, you say that it's hard to find good Russia. It's, it's indeed hard because they're dead or in jail. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the ones who tried. I, the, I had published and cooperated and been, been friends with the, to for um, prominent Russian dissident, one was Boris Nemtsov, he was murdered outside the Kremlin. The other, Vladimir Karamursa, is uh, thrown in jail since recently on indefinite time. So, so it, it really is hard to see. I mean, I guess there are lots of people being silent, and yes, for, I was and going to for themselves, and there has to be something that mobilizes them. I, I want to believe in mankind, so I want to believe that that pos potential exists. Mm. I, I would have to say though that I, I know several people from Russia that do not believe in what their country is doing and would exactly like yourself want to have a completely different life for themselves and, and other people in Russia. So of course there are people like that. Unfortunately don't, they don't have sort of the numbers or the strength today to change things from within but you know that we can find individuals like this all over the world, I'm, I'm sure about it. But do they want to have the completely different life in Russia or they want to live without Russia? That is the main question. I didn't want to have another life in Soviet Union because I understood that it's impossible to be free in Soviet Union. <coughs> that, that is the question, that is the point. We would have to ask the Russians themselves, and at least we don't have a Russian on the panel. No, but, uh, please no. no. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to do some audience questions now, and we actually have a microphone going around. So, two, three, four questions, perhaps? Yeah? Uh, because I'm a historian, I used to think about everything looking through the past and uh, uh, trying to find like parallels in the past and the parallel is um, Germany, right? And uh, in Germany it was really this external pressure first and then it was only the third generation, so <coughs> the grandchildren of those Nazis who, who ha started to reevaluate their past, their um, present and uh, imagine the future and this is uh, and in memory and I'm dealing with memory so in memory this is like a um, common knowledge that it takes a lot of time to process the past our traumas even as a person sometimes it uh, it becomes obvious only after years we uh, we go through the traumatic experience. But uh, I think that is why it's so important this kind of interplay with external pressures, with punishment, with all these uh, justice uh, procedures and courts uh, and the punishment of all the crimes against humanity. It will take less time, even if it takes also a lot of time, like um, we know it from uh, uh, former Yugoslavia case, it took 20 years to get justice. But still it's uh, sooner than it comes to this um, societal changes and societal coming uh, to terms with the past. I am not so optimistic. <laughs> you have to say something more. Than that. <laughs> I, I, I will say a strange thing. Uh, there, are, there are no Russians at all in modern world, because the modern world, the constructions of modern world, uh, modern world is the constructions of political nations. You know, the main, the main. We don't like this this organ, but the main organ is United Nations. Yeah. Not United Monarchies, not United, uh, okay, but United Nations. And the, group, the main problem of Russian history and the Russian present is that they built an empire without the building of political nation. 
That's why uh, they don't have a society, the real society. They don't have the pressure of the society on the on the power. Yeah. That's why uh, in modern world, in we have the political nations. For example, in Sweden, in Sweden, we have political nations. In Germany, in Great Britain, in the United States of America, it's not ethnical nations, political nations. In Russia, we don't see any political nation at all. So, it is a big question. If they lost their empire, without empire, they cannot exist. They will lose their identity. That's why I say that their identity is illness. And for example, about this denazification of Germany, uh, we can imagine that uh, uh, the people, uh, it, it, is, it was possible to treat this illness uh, for example, to, uh, uh, they can uh, read Goethe, for example, yeah? Because, and if we try now to um, treat this illness of Russian, Russian illness and to propose them to read Pushkin, it will be, it will be not so good, yeah? Because Pushkin, uh, Paul Tower, for example, it's a, it, he, he hated Ukrainians, yeah, he hated Polish people, he hated all Caucasian people, so it's a school of hate. And I would say it's it's my territory, so to speak, the history of literature and the history of Russian philosophy. The whole history of Russian philosophy, Russian religion and Russian literature is a school of hate. That's why I don't agree with this text that we fight against Putin, not against Pushkin. <coughs> no. Because Putin, it's, it's a logical con con consequence of Pushkin, of the, of the whole history of Russian so called culture, literature, and so on. Hello. Yeah, so this is the view of uh, Shabushko as well, right? She says the road to war is paved with the books of Russian literature. Very, very good book about that Russian uh, imperial knowledge by Thompson, Eva Thompson. Oh. Imperial knowledge, Russian literature, and imperialism. Yeah, from from Pushkin till the second part of the of the 20th century. Yeah. Ukraine. Torbjörn, yeah, definitely a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and a question I definitely do not know the answer to, so that's very quick. But I, I, would, actually, I would actually not think really in terms of, of that short time perspective. I, I think this is a much more fundamental issue, you know, how much should we spend on Ukraine? I basically think there, there's no end to this. I mean, it's the cost, if we don't support Ukraine now, is worth every dollar or euro or Swedish kroner or whatever. So, I mean, we, we don't even have to go back to history. I mean, it would be interesting to know maybe, but, you know, the loss of lives and the loss of our own security and, and how it influences the whole world, I think, just tells me pretty simply that, you know, we can spend 10 times as much as we have done and we will still be okay. Katarina, briefly. I just want to add a point, I, I can, cannot answer your economic questions, uh, definitely not, but just uh, why it's worth uh, spending on Ukraine, also why it's urgent to spend on Ukraine. Right now the US is still the leader in this, it's taking a huge leadership role in this and it's supporting Ukraine in a formidable way. In one and a half year, there might not be a president that is as willing to do so. So, I mean, that the window is now. <coughs> Good point. Yes. Yeah. My positive thinking is exactly with all the Ukrainians who think that Russia will be, um, will, uh, it will be not Russia really, it will be a different uh, entities. Uh, which uh, will uh, find their own freedom. 
Uh, and I would say that the great mistake to think that the main problem is Soviet Union. Because before Soviet Union, Russia was also aggressive. And it was not a very good country for the people who lived there. It was the prisons of nations, or the prisons of, of the people who live who lived there. That's why it's a great illusion, and the illusion of uh, modern Russian liberals. The, the main problem is uh, communists. I hate communism. Yeah? I, I don't know what, what, what does it mean to live in a communist country. It's terrible. But it's terrible to live in Russia, and not only in 20th century, but in 19th century and from the very beginning, until the end of this evil. evil. I think Katharina might yeah, sure. and thank you Julian for that question. Well, we're already starting <laughs> to see a tendency of the same mistakes being repeated with China. Uh, and not, we're not starting, we're there. Uh, so first of all, don't be dependent of things you really need, strategic things, from bad guys. It's a very simple thing because it comes with, you know, a, a, another price than just a price tag. Uh, so to keep sort of repeating that narrative over and over again, but also I think the European Union should get, it, get its act together and start, you know, enforcing screening, enforcing uh, some, uh, some policies when it comes to this. Uh, other than that, it's a learn from history. This is a question that uh, Julia can answer better, but, you know, know your history and there's been a tendency to sort of lose the historic perspective because we, we, we all want good times. So once once the Soviet Union collapsed, we thought that, okay, now the good times are here and they will be here forever. Uh, but it's never looked like that. And uh, I, I guess just, but that's the problem of every generation, isn't it? Uh, to sort of keep reminding that the bad things might come again. It's not a very good answer, but it's a, an effort. It was a very good answer. Also, usually people say, know your enemy, but you say, know your history. So this is a very good uh, advice. Because this was about history a lot, and I thought just uh, uh, in uh, uh, Tony Chad's book, Post War, he starts like uh, with this um, phrase, um, it comes maybe on the page two, really, that uh, after the war, everyone was uh, happy because it was peace, but no one spoke about Eastern nation, East European nations who felt that it is another occupation. And then uh, Kundera, and we uh, already mentioned him, uh, spoke about this kidnapped Europe, right? That like Western Europe really abandoned Eastern Europe, and he even didn't think about these uh, republics which were in the Soviet Union, because for him Eastern Europe was a Czech Republic, uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland. It was not even like on his mental map, uh, Ukraine or Belarus or whatever. But uh, what uh, we can do, not abandon Ukraine, not abandon Eastern Europe, and listen to Eastern Europe, listen to Ukraine, because if you want to learn uh, something, you learn from somebody who is best on it, and Ukraine is now best on this, how to cope with in insecurity, how to cope with uncontrollability of the world, and we all are coming there because of our environment, because of our all the problems we have, so maybe we will listen more to the people who already are dealing with these problems. Why is Ukraine important to the world? I think it's quite easy because we want to have decent lives in freedom and dignity and, and Ukraine is really demonstrating how important it is. We take it for granted all the time, but you know, that's to me why it's important. And then we can of course talk about trade and great agricultural lands or green energy, blah blah blah, but it's really the symbol of, of dignity uh, that comes first. Um, it's quite just easy and just difficult to me to answer this question because uh, Ukraine is my motherland. That's why I would like to, I understand why the Ukraine is important to the world. 
yeah, uh, but uh, it's a joke, you know. Probably, probably one of the main, one of the main goal of our present uh, existence and our fight against Russia, not only in the field of struggle, not only the, on, uh, the, on the front line, is to tell, to tell uh, the world the real story about Russia. Because yeah? the people who lived, even in Poland. Who lives who live in uh, Germany and in USA or in Great Britain or in Sweden? I think they don't understand what has been Russia, and it's a great task for us, for Ukrainian intellectuals, for Ukrainian writers, philosophers, uh, to, to 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 tell that. And uh, it's it's very good that you you are ready to listen to us now, because 20 years ago it was impossible for me. For example, to tell you about the Russia, yeah. and uh, probably we should find the solution all together. And I will, I will uh, tell you one one example. It was in Kramatorsk three weeks ago. We were there with a mission. We helped there the people and and our militaries. And uh, there were uh, the head of the Ukrainian pan, Volodymyr Yermolenko, my friend and uh, famous Ukrainian philosopher and writer and uh, head uh, leader of uh, Pan Berlin. Uh, it's not of Germany, it's another very interesting history, history story, uh, Denis Yutzel. And we discussed, discussed this issue, what should we do with Russia, how we should tell the people from Germany, for example, the whole issue. And I was very tired after two battle fights, of the, of the battles of wine and I, 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 they, they discussed and discussed and discussed and, and, and tried to find to find the very short slogan and, and I told them this slogan and what it was the end of the communication for the end of the discussion. Let's make Russia small again. <laughs> <laughs> that is solution. Yeah? And probably to find this different solution we Ukrainians should speak with you, with people in Sweden, in in France, in Great Britain, and that that we can bring to you. Yeah? We can bring to you our understanding. Yeah? So we, we are experts in this issue. Yeah? We, we, we do know what Russia means. Yeah? I'd like to add because Vartank uh, is maybe too uh, shy to add because he and uh, Volodymyr Yermolenko and mainly Volodymyr Yermolenko they have this beautiful podcast in English it's called the Ukraine World mm -hmm. and they explain all these issues to the Westerners so we we speak a lot about the West planning like the West is trying to teach us but they are doing their best in teaching the West to understand us. So I really recommend this podcast for everyone. Yeah, it's brilliant. I chime in. It's very good. Katerina, do you want to say one sentence on why Ukraine is important to the world? I just sort of want to echo what Tobiar said, that because Ukraine is fighting for our freedom. Simply, they show what, you know, why it's worth fighting for. And also, it will be shown during Ukraine Vision here, why Ukraine is important will be ongoing until the 20th of February, so for three more days. Humor, stand-up comedy, theater, music, politics, literature, I think every panel will basically uh, highlight why Ukraine is important. Should we do one final question and then... This is the future and uh, Ukrainians really believe in this future because we wouldn't have this war if Ukraine were, were the part of this uh, European Union and NATO. It won't be even the war. So uh, this is the priority number one for Ukraine and its future. Yes. There's no country on earth that is more pro-European than Ukraine. Every poll shows it. Absolutely. There is no country that is. So, I mean, it will be mo the most pro-European member of the European Union. It has the will, it has the capacity. Uh, we have had countries that have had challenges uh, similar or worse to the ones that Ukraine is facing when it comes to rule of law, corruption, etc. And Ukraine is truly demonstrating its will, ambition and capacity to overcome them. So, definitely, we should speed up the membership process. 
Thank you very much for that, Katrina. And I think we should give the panel a big applause.